Hi everybody, thanks for coming. It's again a pleasure to be here at uh, another API Days in sunny Barcelona. Um, I'm gonna, today I'm going to explore a little bit uh, what, uh, what we can do with API discovery, uh, mostly from a consumer or a client point of view, and how we can move things forward as an industry uh, to be able to, you know, to aut automate the whole process of finding APIs and uh, getting your code talking with the APIs. So I'll just start things with, uh, with a bold statement. Uh, in my opinion, right now, we're at the stage where discovery, it's like, you know, a pure luck, a process of like pure luck. Some, probably some marketing, uh, pro probably some, you know, kind of word of mouth or people that tell you that you should try this API or the other API because uh, this one is better. And then in the end, you usually you end up by uh, you know uh, writing a lot of code to to communicate with one of these APIs, and usually it's very hard to switch to any other similar API. So it's like a combination of pure luck and some kind of marketing can be mostly word of mouth. So, but what what exactly uh, is uh, API discovery? You you might be asking now. Uh, so in my opinion, API discovery is like a combination of different factors that I'm going to, to explore just in a, in, a, in, a, in a minute. And I'm going to start by showing what is the status of things right now. How do you discover APIs yourselves manually without, you know, without, without the help of any tools or any automation? So usually, uh, it all starts with some kind of search, right? You have a need in your business, in your company. So you're trying to do something and you eventually you will think, okay, uh, I can do it myself. I can probably code this solution myself, but maybe there's an API that is already doing that. So let me try to find it. So usually you go to the, to the you know, regular places like uh, Google, uh, trying to, to search for specific terms related with your own solution. Uh, eventually you'll, you'll understand that there are some API directories out there and you'll go browsing and trying to, you know, to find whatever you're looking for. Eventually you'll come to a point where you'll realize that there are no APIs that do what, what you need, uh, which happens. Or there are a bunch of APIs that do some of the things that, that you need. And then you try to compare those APIs using you know, different, different factors like pricing, like uh, you know, licensing, uh, you know, rate limiting, all, all kinds of, of stuff. But all of this is being done manually. That's my point. So this first step usually takes a while. Like you usually need to fully analyze what you need. Uh, and you need to understand how different APIs might be able to offer you what, wh whatever you need, whatever, whatever you're looking for. So eventually in the end, you, you will come to a point where you will want you know, to dig deeper and you'll go to about reading the documentation of several of these APIs that you've already found. So you'll find, most probably you'll find out that they, most of them have uh, more or less good documentation nowadays. Uh, but you'll quickly understand that the documentation is not in a standard format and you'll need to go through different web pages, trying to understand how the, the API works, what is the, the, the authorization, how do I start using the API, what are the methods, uh, what kind of protocols are used and all that. Uh, I'm pretty sure that most of you know about all these things. I'm just trying to make a point here, trying to explain what currently, what is the current you know, status uh, uh, of how people do these things. So eventually, after a while, you'll realize that to be able to at least test the API, you'll need to sign up. So you'll need to 
I mean, as, as, a, as, a, as a human, as a user, you will need to agree to certain terms of, of service and sign up in some way to get uh, some credentials that you can then use to uh, make calls to this API that, you're, that you just want to test, you just want to understand what it does. So some of, uh, some of these sign up processes are relatively easy or simple. Uh, but in some other cases, you need to go through different, you know, uh, kinds of uh, agreements or even you need to contact directly the provider and eventually they will give you access to the credentials. So obviously during, during the, this whole process, if you, in the beginning, if you uh, were thinking about three or four APIs, by this time you, you will be thinking of just like two. Or, or just one, because during the whole process you already understood that most of these things don't work for you in some way. Uh, there's bad documentation, sign up takes uh, ages and so on, and it, in the end you'll end up with one or two APIs. So after all this, and after you've finally understood what is the API that you need, you'll go about you know, implementing some uh, code or trying to find if anyone else uh, has already you know, written anything that can be used to communicate with the API. So most of the times, uh, you'll, you'll try to find uh, you know, authorization code, which is like the, the first layer. You'll try to find open source code that can authorize users against the API. Uh, usually, if the API is well known, you'll usually find uh, ready to use code, open source again, but again, most of the times, not endorsed by the API provider. So in that situation, you'll end up with some code that works now, works in, at the moment that you do the implementation, you test it and it works, but there is no guarantee from anyone that the codes will still be working in one month or two or three months or whatever, uh, unless you keep, you know, updating the code yourself, and you keep you know, testing everything and making sure that everything is working. And the, the second layer of code, I would say, is the code that actually you know, talks with the API and actually uses the API. So you have the, the authorization codes and then the second layer. And in this second layer of codes, uh, there are some tools that uh, might be able to, to offer you uh, an SDK Know, software development kit to make API calls, so you don't have even to worry about the, the protocol and all that. And again, these uh, SDKs, most of the time, they are not endorsed or they are not uh, being delivered by the API provider. So in the end, you will get into a situation where you more or less understand what the API does you have some codes that was not written by you, neither the provider. In most situations, you don't have time to go and analyze the whole code and see exactly what, it, what it's doing. And it kind of works. So you test it against your own solution, your own patterns, and you see that it works, and you're happy with it, and that's it. And you don't touch it again. So this is more or less how things go. So after you have all this, after you have all the codes talking with the API, you need to make it work with your own application. So you need to think about uh, what, what is it that you were you know, looking for in the first place and integrate it with your own app. So you need to build some sort of layer in between your app and these other codes. So in, there are, again, different tools that can help you do this. Uh, and again, most of the time you'll end up doing it yourself uh, because you cannot find anything out of the box that can immediately help. So this is more or less uh, how I see uh, you know, the API discovery space right now, right at this moment, and how different developers are, uh, you know, uh, using APIs uh, every day. Whenever someone asks you to build something against a certain API, what are the steps that you need uh, in order to achieve that? 
So obviously, uh, and this is my belief, me and other people, things can and will change eventually. So uh, how can things change? Uh, how can we automate certain parts of this process? And who is doing that already? That's what I'm going to, to show you what, in, the, in the second part right now. So to, to understand uh, better the, you know, the, the automation space, I'll try to go into an exercise of a cost-benefit ex exercise of all these different steps. So on one side, we have uh, how much does it cost to automate a certain step. And on the x axis, we have the benefit for the consumer. So we'll be able to understand uh, uh, what, like, let's say, the search uh, step or the search feature, uh, how much is it worth you know, to uh, uh, automate this step uh, if it doesn't create any benefit to the consumer or otherwise. So let, let's, let's take a look at some of, the, some of, some of these um, steps. So the first step, we have the search. So that was what I was telling you before. Like the first thing you do is you try to find the API that you need to develop your, your own solution. So in this step, what I believe is that it has a high cost of uh, implementing an you know, automation layer on this step. When I, when I talk about automation, again, it's fully, you know, fully automated solution that removes you <clears throat> from, from the process. So basically, you, you just type a few uh, commands and the machine will find the API for you. Uh, so it, it, it probably has a high cost. Uh, most search tools are built for humans. Uh, most uh, you know, reasoning around search capabilities are not built for machines. Uh, but again, there are some, already some efforts in this area. Uh, as you can see, there are some icons there. So programmable web has a, probably the biggest uh, API directory available. Um, like uh, Mashape, uh, you know, uh, APIs.io, uh, Exican, I don't know if you, if you heard this name. They also have a huge uh, API directory with thousands of APIs. And even Google, I mean, you can just go to Google and search. So it works. So basically, the, the efforts around this area are, are mostly related with directories. Uh, mo some of them offer uh, some kind of review and or comparison in between different APIs. And pure search. So you just type a few words, and you will see some, some of the APIs. But none of them are uh, you know, ready to be consumed by uh, a script, by a machine, which is what we're looking for. So why? Probably because it has a high cost. And again, the benefit for the end user is very limited if you think about it. So there is no point in trying to push this too much unless there is a huge benefit in the end. The second uh, step, I would say, is the documentation. So you usually have to read through pages of documentation to understand how the API works. So around this area, the cost is slightly lower than the, the, the search, than auto, for automating the search uh, step. But the benefit is also you know, not so big for, for, for the end user. So uh, I believe that documentation will exist you know, for year, ages to come. So there will, there will always be some kind of layer of human readable documentation. Uh, you as a developer will always want to read the documentation to better understand how things work. And this will never be fully you know, uh, automated into a pure machine readable uh, style. Some efforts around this area, some interesting efforts. Uh, probably you heard about readme.io. Uh, you have Mashree, API, uh, Blueprints. So most of, and Swagger, obviously. So most of the efforts around this are related with uh, generating documentation from machine-readable API definition. So it's not providing the machine-readable definition, it's the other way around. It's like building beautiful documentation from an API definition. 
which is valuable, but it's not what we're looking for. So the third one uh, is around signups, so user provisioning. So around this area, uh, the benefit for the, for the end user is much, much higher because you'll eliminate the cost you know, to entry. So you want to start using the API and you have to sign up. Why? So why can't, can't I just you know, press a button and I start using the API? But the cost is still relatively high. So uh, you have very ancient, you know, very ancient uh, standards and protocols like SAML. Uh, OAuth lets you do this. Uh, I don't know if you, if you ever explored that part, but OAuth 2, uh, one of the grant types of OAuth 2 is the extension grant, and you can do anything you want with that grant type. So Box is, doing, is using OAuth 2 to do user provisioning, as an example. So there are many things that you can do around this, and the space is a little bit, I, I would say, empty or unexplored. Uh, the fourth step, which is code, code generation. So I'm talking about SDKs, ready to use libraries and all that. So this has a huge benefit for the, for the consumer, for the developer. Because you, you, you will get immediately, you know, to be able to use immediately the API without any extra effort. And the cost is very, very low if you think about it. So if you already have an API definition in some machine readable uh, format, the cost from translating that uh, definition into a ready-to-use code is very low. I mean, you just you implement, implement the tool once, and it will generate the code over and over again for any number of different APIs. So in this space, it's a very, very interesting space uh, to explore. There are uh, many different players starting now. So you have REST United, uh, you have SDKs.io, which is a huge API directory. Uh, it's actually it's a partnership between uh, um, Epimatic and uh, Mashape. Yeah, uh, and you have, if you're using a Mac, you have a, a very interesting client called Paw for uh, for Mac, uh, which uh, after you make the API calls, after you test the API, you'll get ready-to-use code in a number of different languages, like PHP, Ruby, uh, whatever, C sharp, whatever. So it's a very interesting area, and I think this will grow a lot in terms of what we can, we can do with, uh, with the code generation. And finally, on the integration space. So what, what I'm talking about integration is making sure that the code keeps working over and over, making sure that uh, uh, whenever the API changes, uh, somehow the code will know about it or will get regenerated or will, will adapt itself to these changes. Um, in this area, I mean, there are also a number of different tools, some related with pure testing, uh, some, some others related with uh, monitoring the APIs, uh, many different things that, that uh, can be still improved in this area. So you have like RunScope, SmartBear, these are two SaaS, uh, they offer uh, testing tools for APIs, so you can build your tests once, and you, you can you know, you know, uh, keep them running over and over again. Whenever something breaks, uh, you'll be notified. Uh, you have Postman, which is another uh, desktop-based um, API client, which can export you know, a definition of the whole API, and then you can run a tool called Newman, which lets you do you know, functional tests on the API. And you have API changelog, which monitors uh, the, the APIs for any changes in documentation. So this is more, uh, let's say, a, a documentation layer and monitoring tool. So looking at, at, the, at the big picture, you can now see that uh, more or less, you know, uh, all these steps, you know, fill like the whole space of the, the, the cost benefit graph. So what, what I believe most companies are, are doing now is they are exploring the search you know, uh, space, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me because it doesn't have a lot of benefits uh, to the end user. And 
some of them are uh, exploring the code generation space. Uh, not many of them are exploring the integration space, uh, the, the, the user provisioning, and so on. So I think there's a lot of room here for improvement, and that's my point with this, with this presentation. So where, where do I think we will get from here? So we'll get to a point where eventually everything will be you know, machine readable and machine consumable. And I believe that this will happen with uh, APIs.json format. So I don't know if you've heard about APIs.json. It's like a meta format for describing APIs, not the API endpoints themselves, but what uh, an API is capable of doing. So it can describe human documentation, for instance, like where is the documentation? So APIs.json will tell you that. Like, uh, how much uh, is the API? So if I want to make a 1,000 calls a day, how much will I pay? How do I sign up? Uh, do I have a machine-ready sign-up, or do I have to go to some form, or do I have to send an email to someone, or make a phone call? And the endpoint description. So it combines a number of different, uh, um, let's say, uh, uh, items, documentation items, into a single format that uh, is machine readable. So, and then you can provide all these items to, to users, to, to humans, and also you can consume some of them uh, with some scripts uh, that will automate part of the process. So how, how do I see this happening? This is just an example. Uh, the APIs.json format uh, lets you do things like this. You know, let, let you add to the HTML of any web page. This is, this is an example with Product Hunt. So let's say you're on Product Hunt homepage. And unless you, 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 you go and see the source file, uh, you will not see this, obviously. But let's see that there's some script running on the browser or uh, some tool that you have that is trying to find information about Product Hunt API. So that tool will go through the HTML and will, will read this link uh, elements and uh, we'll find out different things like in this example what this tells you is that there's a, a human readable documentation text HTML documentation with a URL and then you have an APIs.json file on another location so basically whatever is reading this will immediately understand that uh, they can provide documentation for the reader for the human uh, and they can also parse the APIs.json and then uh, get more information out of it. So this is not on product hunt. Huh? This is just me. <laughs> this is just me, uh, you know, trying to look into into the future. So the whole thing, in my opinion, will come eventually at some point. Will come to this. Will come to to, to having APIs.json, uh, where you can find information about pricing, licensing, provisioning. Um, I mean, in terms of service, um, rate limiting, you know, all these items related with how you can use the API. And then APIs.json will point to some form of machine readable documentation, it can be Swagger in, in that example, that will provide you know, information about cap uh, capabilities, uh, eventually uh, let you generate on the fly the code you need to talk with the API and let you, you know, push that information into some testing tool like RunScope and do automated testing. So I'm not a believer in SDKs, like in, in, in having, in downloading a, a, a full SDK uh, uh, and use it from scratch and then updating it every, every once in a while. What I believe in is on the fly code generation. So at this moment we cannot, you know, we cannot run away from the SDKs because that's all we have. But I would love to see in a, in a near future, you know, uh, some way of, you know, building something once and then it, the code will adapt itself uh, to be able to keep talking with the API. Obviously following, you know, the company rules and, 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 and all the testing procedures and so on. And, well, and that's, that's it. That's how I see the, the, the future of uh, API discovery and how automation can work and, uh, Trying to make, make a better world for all of us, eventually. <laughs> Thank you. 
we have time for a few questions. Yeah, two questions here. Hey, Bruno, that was really fantastic. Um, uh, exciting progress around the idea of search. Then, I sp uh, with the theme of this conference, including machine learning and natural language processing, then I sort of see also a step just before getting to the APIs.json file where if, if you could do some sort of, if, if a business could just even, or a community group that's wanting to use API, uh, APIs to do visualizations of data or anything like that, if, um, if, you, if you put in, say, your Twitter handle or your um, business uh, URL or something, mm -hmm. and then apply some sort of natural language processing or text mining to identify what are the keywords that are important to your Organ, you know, to your um, point of view, and then have that um, be searched against the APIs.json metadata, so that that would then surface the initial run of the APIs that people might want to use in their um, processes. What do you want to comment, or what do you think of that? Yeah, sure. So the the idea, if I understood correctly, is trying to analyze your online profile. Uh, it can be on Twitter or anywhere else, for for that matter and infer from, from that information what are the APIs that you would like or that you would need to use in the future and provide you ready to consume information about that. I think it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting approach. I would probably start with, uh, with a, you know, some a different service like GitHub uh, where you can you know, infer much more from uh, user information like what kind of languages are the user uh, uh, are they using uh, uh, go deep into the code and trying to analyze what API calls they are making and so on? But I think it's a very interesting approach. But it's as you said, it's a more you know artificial intelligence, if you want, uh, or uh, you know machine learning than just the automation. So it's I would say it's a step beyond. Uh, after you have the whole automation in in play, uh, you. I think that's, that will be you know, much, much stronger then. Because right now, the way I see it, you would be able you know, to provide some, some clues or some suggestions, but it, it would be just some pointers or some, some links to, to some documentation, and that's it. The whole process, exactly. It's very interesting. It's a very interesting approach. I'm, I mean, I'm not sure how it will be implemented, but if that's <laughs> what you're looking for, but uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting. But eventually, I believe that it, it will come to a point where all these things will, you know, will not only make more, much more sense, but will be easier to implement. And that's, that's the goal. After you have certain you know, tools in place, you can then connect them together and, and get different things. Thank you for these wonderful resources, Bruno. And uh, this is a question for you and maybe also for Mehdi. Uh, will we get access to the slides? There were a lot of small icons. We never got the exact URL. There's some services there like Exicon or Group Prints or, you know, that I've never heard before. And I just couldn't tell by the icon where would I have to go, so. Okay, that's very, that's a great uh, suggestion. And obviously, uh, I, I, will, I will make the slides available. And I will make sure and talk with Mehdi that uh, you will you all get information about where the slides are after. Yeah, we will work on slide discovery. But, uh, okay. <laughs> no, but you're right, you're Very right, good. so we'll share. <laughs> yeah, slide and videos of every talk, yeah. But uh, uh, it's true, uh, an icon doesn't, is not enough. Uh, I agree with that. Thank you, Renaud. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you.